All right. All right, so I uh, already introduced myself once, but just again, uh, my name is Matt Follett. Uh, I'm the organizer of this. I work for Observable Networks. Uh, quick plug for them, kind of an interesting fact, both of their founders are professors. Uh, one of them is an adjunct professor, and the other one is a full-time professor at the Washington University. Um, so when uh, I asked them if I could do a meeting about academic papers, they were really excited about the idea. Um, hopefully they can um, maybe even uh, give us some people to do talks at some point. Um, the paper that I'll be presenting is uh, Adaptive Road Following, uh, full title, adapt Adaptive Road Following Using Self-Supervised Learning and Reverse Optical Flow. Um, uh, the paper was originally published in 2005, came out of the uh, Stanford AI Lab. It was research that was used uh, for the Stanley um, uh, self-driving car, which is what won the uh, Dover Grand Challenge. Um, it was... Uh, uh, this paper was written by, by those three guys, uh, Lee, Looking Bill, and Thrain. There are also um, a couple other papers on this topic. Like This is literally just on the specific research that they did. A bunch of papers came out of, out of that research. Um, and I won't be going over these, but if you look through them, you'll notice that it's, they're pretty similar um, in a lot of ways. Obviously, self-driving cars have a lot of um, applications in uh, society. Uh, like not having to drive your own car means that you're less likely to be in accidents, that sort of thing. Uh, it's useful for industrial automation. Um, you know, uh, Amazon actually bought a company last year or the year before that uh, totally automates warehouses. It's really cool. They're these little robots that drive around and like move um, whole shelving units to where they're supposed to be to, to um, optimize the loading of packages and that, that sort of thing. Um, those don't work anything like this. Uh, they actually have a totally different system, but uh, those require a lot of setting up, um, uh, so they have a, a, a large uh, um, upfront cost. Whereas if you had something that was like more intelligently just navigating the thing, uh, you could just throw it in, in a normal warehouse. Um, and obviously for space exploration, it takes um, 20 minutes to get a message from here to the Mars rover on average. Obviously that, that differs depending on where the Earth and, the, and Mars are in relation. Um, but you don't control the Mars rover like you control oh, an RC car, you control it by telling it waypoints. And so it has to be able to detect things that it's going to run into. Um, it has to uh, do uh, path planning, that sort of thing. Um, so it's not looking for roads like this paper is looking for, but it is looking for paths. And actually what you'll find uh, with this paper that's kind of interesting is that uh, uh, whereas the paper is talking about looking for roads, roads aren't actually relevant. <laughs> um, what's relevant uh, becomes the thing that looks like the thing that the car is currently on, which is a lot more like what you would expect for like a Mars rover, it's not looking for a road, it's looking for a thing that looks as safe as the thing that it just drove onto. Um, uh, to give you a little bit of prior work, uh, we'll go all the way back to the beginning, uh, not the beginning, but really early research. Uh, NavLab 1, uh, which was out of Carnegie Mellon. Um, really interesting project. It's, so this, this, uh, this vein here is Nav, NavLab 1, and it is a van like that out of necessity. It actually has something like 15 racks in it. It had a um, warp supercomputer uh, along with a whole bunch of other hardware. Um, it uh, was able to travel at uh, very low speeds, but it, they, they started off with that. Um, and uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, continued that from like 1984 was when they first started that, I think, or that's when some of the early uh, papers came out of that to like 2005-ish, late, uh, late aughts was when uh, NavLab 11 was done. And it's kind of cool to see the progression from a hardware standpoint is, you know, early on, they needed a whole van to fit all this stuff. And uh, by the end, they had it all stuffed into a Jeep. Um, but to, to talk about, um, that is sad. Uh, <laughs> well, well, goodbye. Um, to talk about uh, this stuff a little bit, the, um, the way that NavLab 1 actually worked was uh, it actually used uh, two color, cam uh, color vision cameras. Um, and it would actually look at uh, the color and the texture to, com to find roads. It would, uh, they, they had four uh, predefined um, Gaussian uh, uh, cluster, or uh, 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 the word is escaping me, the uh, uh, <coughs> layouts that they would use that um, would define what a road looks like and four that were what a road didn't look like. 
and they would just take all of the pixels on the screen and match them based on that color. And then they would go through and they had um, some predefined expectation as to what a, uh, uh, a road looked like in terms of like how cracked up it was, how much the, the texture changed, and they just, they just plot that. And um, uh, that actually uh, worked pretty well. I think they got the vehicle up to like 30 miles per hour. But you can get an idea of what this stuff looked like. So this was the original image. Mind you, uh, this was originally done in, in 1984. So this was uh, maybe at one point a color picture that was then scanned, that was then put into a PDF. That was a, Like this has gone through a couple of uh, generations, unfortunately. But you get an idea. Here's the road right here. Uh, pretend it's in color. Um, the color, or the, uh, the color classification would come up with something like this, which is really good uh, on a road because they already knew what a road was going to look like. And then the texture classifi classification came up with the road being this here, which is not as good. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then the overall uh, combining the two, it, this was the final road that it came up with. Um, one thing to note is that you'll notice these are two very different things. They really heavily weighed the color over the texture because it turns out the texture is not very trustworthy. Roads aren't nearly as clean as you would expect, especially as our infrastructure continues to decline. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, they, they would apply a, a Huff transform to the uh, road pixels uh, to find the, the new road. Um, and then they would actually use the, the uh, colors and whatnot that they got from the definition of a road that time to feed into the system for the next time. Um, and uh, uh, one thing that's not terribly relevant about finding roads, but is kind of an interesting thing if you want to look into it. They had uh, a system called Alvin, which was the, um, I don't remember what Alvin stood for, but it was a neural network that they used. They would um, have a driver drive the vehicle for like five minutes, and Alvin would be recording the road based off of um, you know this, and it would generate, uh, from watching the driver, it would generate which way the steering wheel should turn, based off of what direction the road was going. And it, it had um, uh, some number of inputs and it had like five outputs based on uh, telling you like which of, of five ways the steering wheel should be turned. And that was kind of neat. Um, uh, not, not relevant because it's not about finding roads, but it is kind of a neat topic. Um, so uh, I was wrong before, I guess. It uh, got up to 20 miles per hour. Um, <clears throat> it did need an initial uh, monitoring of humans and it didn't need prior knowledge of road appearance. Um, in applications like, say, you know, self-driving cars, that's fine because you're not going to have a self-driving car drive down the desert, uh, you know, a desert road. Well, you might, I don't know. Um, but it's certainly not uh, a normal case. So then um, we'll jump all the way ahead uh, to this paper. Um, and the way that it worked was uh, a little different. What it would... Um, there's food in there if you want to. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, the way that it would actually work is uh, it would, it would uh, at a very high level, it would take um, the, a new image, and then it would take previous images that it had seen, and it would calculate the optical flow of, of those, um, of, uh, between those two images. And um, then it would uh, take templates that, it, that it, it found and match those templates based off of the optical flow, and um, uh, then try and match the road uh, based off of those templates, uh, which is a very high level. So we'll go into it a little bit uh, uh, lower. So um, first thing it would do is it would actually, all of this stuff was done uh, in grayscale. Um, and so it would take these images and it would do feature detection based off of them. So what we would have is um, you, would, you would take one of these grayscale pictures and uh, there's a, a Shai Tomasi um, feature detection algorithm that you can run that basically is just looking for edges along the image. And I'm not going to go into exactly how that works, uh, but it's actually readily available on Wikipedia. You can look it up. Um, but it would find all of the edges in the image, and then it would look at the previous frame uh, that it was comparing, and it would find where those edges existed in one image versus the other image. And based off of that, that was how these, these things were flowing between the, uh, the, the pictures. So like these white lines that you're seeing here, there was probably like a little rock here and a little rock here, and it defined those as being the same rock. So it said, okay, well, that's the path that that rock was taking between these pictures. And then what they could do to, to simplify this is um, 
they would uh, uh, take these those two pictures and they would just find the mean uh, displacement vector between them and that would be kind of the flow between these pictures. Um, so that would allow you to be able to go back and like track different objects as it was moving through different pictures, um, which was something kind of important for the next step. Um, because then the next thing that they would do is they would define some uh, location in the image as being the, the definition region, the, the region that they believe is a road based off of the fact that the um, vehicle is on it right now. So like if you, if you were, um, if you were in the vehicle, you would be under some spot, or you would be over some spot right now, right? So it would look a couple seconds back and find that same spot that you're currently on in a previous picture. Now, if you're on something, that's probably a road, or it's probably some. Even if it's not a road, it's something that you can legitimately be driving on because you're doing it. And if you're, if if you shouldn't be on it, it's probably too late. <laughs> so, so it would make the assumption that I can find something in uh, the in in a previous image that is what I'm on right now, and that's what I that looks like what I want to be on the next time. The, the the paper talks about this as being a road. Realistically, it's a safe spot. Uh, to exist with, with this vehicle. It doesn't matter if it's a road, it could be a ditch that happens to be a really nice thing to drive on. I don't know. Um, but you, uh, you find that, and then you go back through all of those images that you have cached, and you find that same region uh, in each one. And those become your templates for um, what a road should look like at different distances. So, um, So then, um, once you have those templates, you take those, those they're, they're very thin templates that you've generated that exist at different heights. You then take each one of those, and um, you're going to use those to find the road in the next set of images. Um, and the way that you'll do that, first thing you have to do is, uh, because desert roads are, well, really anything, is not perfectly flat, you're going to have the vehicle moving up and down, um, and that moving up and down is going to change the the angle that the camera's positioned at, which is going to change like the, the perceived distance between like you and the horizon. So the first thing you do is you have to find the horizon, which um, you use a Huff transformer for again, uh, which is really common to use for that sort of thing. Um, and if somebody wants to do a paper on Huff, or do a, a presentation on Huff transforms at some point, they're actually really interesting and show up in, in lots, of, lots and lots of things. Um, but then once you have the idea of the horizon, you would then um, scale the, the uh, uh, templates that you have to match the the uh, concept of a uh, of the space from now to the horizon that you have, and um, you would uh, then take those templates and try and find where in the image best matches that uh, template. And uh, they used for this they, as a um, metric they used the sum squared distance of of the two images. Um, Uh, and yeah, like, like I said, uh, th there was kind of an interesting point in the paper where they talked about um, how they're doing the, the scaling and how the scaling can cause for uh, particularly wide or particularly narrow templates. And um, they made a point to mention that if it, in some situations the, the uh, template becomes very wide, and the only other, or in the other case where that, the template might become that wide is if the vehicle was actually rolling. Um, which I didn't think about, but, but it makes sense. Um, and it also seems odd that they mentioned it. <laughs> Which makes me wonder if they had a case where they had rolled the vehicle and noticed that that, that was a, a failure case. Because uh, that's not something you would think about, just like, huh, well, how will this fail? Well, if the vehicle's rolling, it might. Yeah. That also stood out to me, and they, they described it as a moderate roll. Yes, yeah, yeah, moderate <laughs> roll. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> we totally didn't roll this. Yeah. <laughs> really expensive equipment. Yeah. <laughs> Just moderate. Um, so, uh, so yeah, does anybody have any questions so far at this point? I've been kind of like flying through this stuff. I was hoping you were going to touch on moderate roll. <laughs> <laughs> I really, yeah, I, I don't know the history of that, but I, I would like to know. <laughs> Uh, so they may, maybe they're just talking about roll like this, not yeah, actually. Kind of oh, maybe just yeah, just like if it's yeah, that could be the case. Uh, <laughs> it's I mean, just kind yeah. of a dashed off comment though. Yeah, like, oh, yeah, yeah, this could be a roll. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Is there much mention in the paper of how the algorithm bootstraps itself since they're realizing this cache of... Yeah, game? so that's kind of one of the interesting things about this paper uh, is that the one of the things that, that, that this approach does that, that uh, it was supposed to solve is that, or that one of the things this, this approach was supposed to solve was that you didn't have to have like somebody, you didn't have to have a preconception of what these things were. Uh, what they don't quite mention in the paper is that for you to, um, for this to work, you have to have basically kind of buffered uh, some amount of distance previously. And I actually don't know how, because they, they, they just ignore it. Like, they don't mention it at all. And I don't know how they went about solving that problem. I probably remembered at some point, because the first time I read this paper was years ago, and I, I uh, read a couple other things around it. But um, <clears throat> I don't completely know what they did. Because this was, this was, ultimately, this was used in the, the DARPA Grand Challenge. And that was had to be completely autonomous. So I don't know if they just assumed like the first part of the road was straight, so they could drive on it for some amount of time, just telling the vehicle to go straight, or what they what it is they did. They probably bootstrapped with some other algorithm and then ran with that. It seems like depending on the uh, like how quickly it can determine like what is road like or what yeah. is good. Mm -hmm. If you maybe it only needs a few feet, in which yeah. case you just assume that you haven't parked it in front of a wall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that was the other question. Yeah, what happens uh, when the road leads to a wall, there's nothing road-like. So, so it talks about that. Um, there are a couple of things. If you, uh, there, there's actually a, a real failure point, both with like the original NavLab 1 and with this, and it's not even just walls, it's actually shadows. Because if you take a shadow, and you have your reference, and I'm totally jumping ahead of myself, but that's okay. Um, if you if you uh, take your your reference section and it has no shadow in it at all, and then you're driving like next to a forest all of a sudden, that's going to look completely different than the previous thing. And um, MadLab one had the same issue. This has has a similar issue. Um, as long as yeah, as long as the abrupt change that you're about to run into somehow has made it into your reference, it'll actually assume like if you hypothetically parked in front of a wall, or ended up in front of a wall, such that it ended up in your reference frame, which would mean that you were already on the wall, which is pretty much impossible, um, <laughs> then you would, it would attempt to drive through the wall. Um, but they mention in the paper that, uh, that one of the things that you can use as a, as a heuristic is to determine whether or not you're actually going in the right way is if it attempts to find um, matches against the template based off the reference region, and it can't find any, then you probably ended up like in some weird situation, like you drove off the road, uh, the road somehow disappeared out from under you, that sort of thing. If it's already having troubles with shadows, is there a viable use case, like in the real world, like can it drive with other cars on the road? Yeah, I mean, they, they successfully used it through, through. It's, it's only when the shadows, um, like, appear out of, like, appear in such a way that they weren't in the reference, like they weren't in the reference frame, but they are now in the thing. And it still had uh, a fairly good success rate, even even with that. It was just degraded success at that point. Um, they talk about the, that in the results section. I don't remember the exact. I, I didn't have time to read yeah. it. Yeah. No, that's fair. That's fair. Um, but uh, but what, what they what they had in the results section was they basically had like three different approaches or three different like big sections of video that they tested. They had one that was like just a straight like perfect case, straight road, no shadows. Obviously, you know. Uh, road, not road type stuff. And they're like, yeah, perfect. Um, why, why are they calling it reverse optic flow? Because they're taking, the, so they're taking the, uh, the optical flow of the image as it's, um, you know, like, like they're, 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 they're finding the flow of like all the different rocks and all the different things, on the, all the features on this, uh, uh, in each of the images. And then they're reversing that to find the uh, previous uh, locations of the template, of the, the reference, so that they can then use those references as templates. So, so like, are they trying to predict out where it's? Here, let me let me pull up this picture here. So, um, like, what they're doing here, so they already have some concept of flow in these images at this point, right? They've already calculated that. They've cached that. They have a vector that defines how things are flowing from this image to this image, and from this image to this image, and this image to this image, right? Um, now they have this reference region that they want to use. Um, the definition region is the way what they define it as. And they want to find this definition region in these previous pictures. So they reverse that vector that they had that defined going from here to here. And they use that to define, like, this definition region must be here based off of that optical flow that they had. So that's all they're saying is, like, they take the optical flow 
they reverse it, and then they look for the location that they previously were in in the next image, or in the, in the previous image. Because they're trying to find this reference region in each spot along the way. And then they take these reference regions that existed in previous images, because this is, you got to remember, this is the exact same spot on the Earth, or that's the goal, is that these are always the exact same spot on the Earth in all these different pictures. So they're saying, okay, if I have, excuse me, some number of pictures that show this region of the Earth, then I can find something that looks like this region of the Earth in, in future pictures. So once they have that, then they go through, I don't have a picture of it. Basically, once they have that, they go through and they look at the next set of pictures, and they're looking for things that look like these sections in that next picture. I think you could just call B time T, and then now A is the next one. Oh yeah, you could go the other yeah. way, yeah. So like, if we pre pretended this was the reference region, well... Almost. Almost, yeah. If we pretend this is the reference region, then we're kind of looking for something like this in the future, in the next set of pictures. And then ultimately what they do is they take all of those... Um, all of those uh, templates that they had of what the road looked like, the road that they're on right now looked like in the past, they then project that into the future to find all these new spots, and then they take all those templates and they try and match, match them against things that exist in the current picture, and they, they define a road based off of that. Um, so, I just no question. I just found you guys last night, so I, I very, very quickly scanned this picture. Yeah. Um, but, so, how are they finding, like, where the, the past rock is? Like, mm -hmm. how, how are they deciding that that is the same rock? So, like, they I use know? they use this algorithm called the, the Lucas Kincaid, tra uh, Kincaid Tracker to uh, track the features between the different okay. pictures. Um, and then, once they have, like, this rock is the same rock in these two pictures, then they have the, the concept of a flow between those two rocks. Thanks. So they do. They 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 start off with uh, Shai Tomasi. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if I'm pronouncing any of these things. Uh, uh, they start off with Shai Tomasi, and uh, which actually goes by another name, but I don't remember the other name. Um, and once they've found all of the features, then they keep that. And when they look at the next picture, they take those features and the features from that previous picture, and they find. The, uh, the 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 they, they track them between the two with with that uh, with the Lucas Canade is my understanding. It's not really spelled out a whole lot in the paper. It's just we yeah. use these algorithms. Yeah. In fairness, I actually uh, while reading this recently, it, it occurred to me that the first like four times I read this paper, I actually misunderstood one of the things that that was in here because I had initially when I read this had taken this to mean like they were taking these, like they were taking a picture and saying like, okay, we already know these things are roads, so yeah. like all, like in one picture, but they're not doing that. Yeah. They're finding it across all these different ones. Um, any more questions? Yeah. You, you mentioned uh, feature detection where it finds the rock and it finds the rock in the past and then it generates like a displacement vector yeah. to generate optical flow, but that's under the assumption that the car is the only thing moving, right? Yes. Yeah. So, well, what would happen? Like, let's let's take for example. Let's say that um, you do have things in here uh, where other things where things are moving against the uh, like have a different uh, flow than what you would expect. Like, you can see there's a whole bunch of stuff that's kind of moving like this, which is what you would expect because you're traveling forward. Um, but then you have a few things like there's a rock here that went like towards the vehicle, um, and there's something over here that went like that way. Um, it's still successfully finding those things, but then when it um, when it puts all that together, or maybe it's not, maybe it's it's misclassifying two rocks as the same thing. It doesn't really matter um, because then what they do is they take all of these vectors that they've created from all these different features uh, movement, and they they find the mean of that, and that's the the connection between the different images. So a simple mean will you know wash out the signal from like a rock tumbling around or whatever. That's the claim. But possibly, like, a, if, they were, if it was on a freeway, it might end up misclassifying everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it could, if you were driving down the highway and all these cars were moving around, then in you different might... Rates, right? yeah. Or something with differential like acceleration in front yeah. of you would probably yeah. be a weird billboard yes. next to you. And... Yeah. So this would only really work in a desert, 
road. I mean, it, it, it worked for them in a competition, so there were other vehicles driving around. I mean, unless they just got up in front, and I don't think they did, and just like, <laughs> ran it the whole way. <laughs> it works at 100 miles an hour. There's, there's a lot not specified here, too, yeah. about collision avoidance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, this is this is strictly just, just road finding road. the road. Yeah, finding the road. So, like, and this is just one of the many, many papers that got published on this. So it's very possible that there's a whole other paper that's like, here's how we took this and made it work with cars. <laughs> but this one, was, that was out of scope. Um, so, uh, any, any more questions? I think these questions are a lot better than my presentation, so I'm actually thinking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I remember correctly, like first grand challenge, I mean, I may, I may be completely off, but I think it was like a miserable failure for everybody. And I think Carnegie Mellon went down the side. I think it had to do with this algorithm because there was a another road that like diverged. Yeah, uh, the first the first grand challenge was really bad. Actually, the second grand challenge wasn't that great for some people either. Like there were some really bad, um, but but yeah. It, I don't know if they used this because this was this is from the Stanford team, so I don't know if they if the Stanford team was like fixing what or improving upon the um, but, but yeah, there's there's some great stories out of the Darpa Grand Challenge. There was one group that this guy um, like uh, like senior level engineer quits his job, decides he wants to like his goal is to win the Darpa Grand Challenge. Like puts everything in his life towards towards winning this thing. Uh, Develops a self-driving motorcycle, um, which I mean, the thing could like it had it had um, gyroscopes to stay up. Just amazing thing. Um, it was actually a really good contender. People had, people had really high hopes for this thing. Uh, it only made it about ten feet because they forgot to turn the, the the balancing gyroscope on, and so it just went forward and fell over. <laughs> uh, which is just so like. I mean, I'm sure that guy's doing fine now because he did an amazing thing, and surely somebody was like, well, that's obviously some amazing technology, and we need to hire this person because they'll, we'll hire someone else to turn the gyroscope off. <laughs> 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 yeah. but, you don't have to hire someone in terms of that. There you go, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but so the, there's some really interesting stories that, that came out of the, the, the Dark Grand Challenge. And my understanding is, is that most of the people who won, the uh, who were on the uh, Stanley team that won, are now working for um, Google, working on the self-driving car. So, um, so surely they figured that oh, he's gone. I was gonna say surely they figured out the car thing, but now um, finding the other dealing with the other cars. Um, so yeah, once once you uh, going back to, to where we were. Um, so once you've you've done this this template matching, um, you then all you're really doing is you're taking all of those those uh, uh, spots on the map that you thought or all th spots on the image that you thought were probably road. And you just have to try and connect them together. So what they what they did um, was they started off at the horizon, uh, and this image is actually kind of a bad example because the horizon's up here, but uh, the road kind of does this thing going on. Um, but they uh, they they started off at the horizon, the the furthest point of the road, and they just worked their way back, um, defining the cost of picking a spot based off of the the uh, difference between the image and the template image. And then a cost based on how much of a curvature you're putting onto the road, uh, because if you put too much of a curvature on the road, that's very unlikely that it's actually a road anymore. Um, and uh, once they define that that uh, that cost graph, they get all the way to the end, and then they just walk it back up for for the lowest cost. Mm -hmm. um, so that is that. Uh, the results were that it, it outperformed the the color and the, and the texture matching. Um, in fact, what they actually did was to make sure that this uh, this thing was better than the old version, uh, or better than other approaches. They actually went and implemented uh, a color matching approach, similar to what, what I talked about early on, and a texture matching approach, and ran those against the same uh, desert, the the same videos of desert that they did for this one, and um, what they what they found out was the color matching one was just like, it was really good for finding where the road was, but it was also really good for finding everything else. Um, because everything is the same color in the desert. Um, and the textures really weren't much better. Um, all three had issues moving in and out of shadows, which I already talked about. And this thing ran, um, at the time, at about three hertz, which is sufficient. Uh, really no problem with that. 
Um, if you want to go on about this, uh, I mentioned some papers at the beginning that were strictly about this. There are some other papers that talk about interesting things about uh, uh, the, this sort of stuff. I'll put these. Uh, I'll send these out to you. Okay, cool. Um, but um, there's a uh, let's see. This guy, uh, this survey here, it's old. It's from like 2005. In fact, it actually only mentions um, 10 of the 11 uh, nab labs. Um, but it's kind of neat. It talks about a whole bunch of different approaches that have been used for um, vision and, and robotic systems. Um, color vision for road following, that actually is one of the talks from the NavLab One guys, and it talks about how uh, it actually worked. The, the, the hardest thing about reading this paper, because it's actually fairly easy to read, the hardest thing about reading this paper is that it was like literally typed on a typewriter and then scanned and is now a PDF. Um, and that's just, uh, it's hard to read. <laughs> it's like literally hard to read, not hard to understand. Um, <laughs> the words are hard to 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 to, to, to count, like get. Um, uh, Pan's a portal, uh, portable navigation um, platform. This is actually available as as like an HTML thing, so it's really easy to find. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, another paper about the uh, Carnegie Carnegie Mellon Nav Lab, uh, really good. Cool, and uh, that's really it. So, any more questions? I, I did this one a little short because I figured um, people would be getting a little late because it's or getting getting a little late because you know you don't really like first time here and uh, also I had a little administrative stuff at the beginning so I didn't want to take too much time but I didn't want to make it shorter or anything so I hope uh, I hope everybody really liked it. So so it's yeah. uh, what uh, ten years ago now is it still considered a pretty modern approach or are they doing it completely differently now? Um, I think it's still I mean it's it's certainly a basis for for how it's done. Um, <clears throat> Uh, as, as I understand, it's still a basis for how things are going. I mean, the fact that like this team is now also doing cutting edge stuff. But the thing right. is, like once they go to Google, I don't think as much gets published anymore. <laughs> right. Um, right. Uh, yeah. At least it's it might be harder to find those. Um, this was, for what it's worth, um, when I had taken uh, when I've been working on my master's, uh, not but two years ago. This was a a, a, a must read paper okay. uh, in the in the field of uh, computer uh, vision and robotics. So at the very least, it's still considered relevant for people learning. Yes. Kind of stuff, yeah. You know, so. yeah. And it's a really neat approach, and it's fairly light. Like, right. I, it takes a couple of times to read, but once you get it, you're like, oh, this is really easy. <laughs> so. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's not like they're doing like ten or twenty algorithms. It's yeah. For the most part, it's like what two or three. Yeah, and uh, the cool <laughs> thing is, is everything in here is uh, implemented in OpenCV. So if you wanted to go home and like put this together in Python, like. I actually thought about like what I really wanted to do if I had the time. If I hadn't just uh, just just to give you guys an idea of uh, if you think you don't have time to do a presentation. In the last month, I've switched jobs, done a cruise, and my daughter started walking around the house. Um, <laughs> so uh, I bet that we probably have about the same amount of time. <laughs> um, but what I really wanted to do if I had more time was I was gonna uh, re-implement this and then take it in the parking garage. Because the parking garage has no lines whatsoever, but it has really well-worn paths where all of the cars drive. And it's not a desert, but it's just like a desert. <laughs> so I was going to do that, but uh, I went on a cruise instead. Uh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Audi just drove a car from, they drove to CES. Yeah. From LA to Vegas, right? Yeah, yeah. Just like a week ago. But I think that they have like thermal and... Yeah. Matt, yeah. Red, yeah. 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 All you need to do is get the tail lights in front of you. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it is. Yeah. Well, it just... Yeah. And uh, yeah, and a radar to make sure you don't hit them, and yeah. then you're good. Because yeah. you will hit traffic in the middle of nowhere, LA to Vegas. It makes no sense. One thing that I wondered about reading this was how much the velocity of the car was assumed. They touch on it very briefly. At yeah. The end. Do you know they, any more about? They completely assumed the velocity of the car. I mean, so they the 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 test that they were running against was from video from the previous year. Or video from sometime. I yeah. I don't know that they get the source. I think it was the previous year, but maybe they just went to the desert and recorded. It. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they, they they talk about having assumed uh, constant speed. But realistically, like the approach that they're giving, if you a you can get like you're in a robotic car, you can certainly get the speed yeah. um, through a couple of different means. Uh, and b even if you couldn't, you could still discern a, a reasonable speed from the the, the, the optical. Right. Yeah, I wondered if it just if most of that was irrelevant because from the optical flow, you yeah. don't really care. 
I think, I mean, I, I think realistically, like, if you wanted to put this in production, you probably want to use the optical flow and, like, GPS and well, basically yeah. any piece of data you can get. Right. But, like, right. for, for the purposes of, like, proving it, I think optical flow is probably sufficient. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, there were two things they assumed. There was, they assumed a constant speed, and the, or a reasonably constant speed, and they assumed something else, and I don't remember what Yeah. Yeah, I could see large deceleration or acceleration kind of messing with it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's when you just keep going straight, though. <laughs> yeah. Things work out. <laughs> I would definitely like have to look into this transform for finding the horizons. I'm thinking about the California desert, and I'm thinking that finding the horizons is a non trivial problem. Because yeah. you've got mountains. Yeah, it's true. In all yeah. directions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, when I think of horizon, I think of like, you've got pretty much a line, but no, that's really not the case. Yeah. But it, I actually thought. Was previous work, you would you think that you'd build on top of that the horizon yeah. thing, but that was. No, I'm pretty sure. I thought the hub transform was was previously used for horizon horizon. I think no, that's I, what I, I think. I mean, uh, it feels like you could have got a paper out of the. Just assume a flat road. Yeah. Yeah. Case, oh yeah. But this. Yeah. Dealt with both. I don't think it would matter if it was a mountain range because, it's just going to look for linear features, so yeah. even a mountain, it would probably be easier to find it. Yeah. Because there's going to be more linear features for it to find as opposed to a smooth curve that may be hazed. Yeah. So suppose the, the mountain is all in your field of vision. Yeah, that, yeah. that would be a problem. Yeah. If, yeah. if there's a yeah. change between sky and right, right. Yeah. foliage, then it's be easier. Yeah. Now, one, one question I have is why couldn't you just kind of follow what looks like a road? Why would you need to necessarily care about the horizon? You, it, it stops looking like a road because it's the horizon. It was the uh, hill aspect, I think, was yeah. the... So oh, right, because yeah. uh, you could be pointing... Right. Yeah, because, okay. yeah, based off of the angle that you're at, you're going to have a different perspective of... That, yeah, that's right, you mentioned that. <laughs> it, uh, another thing that I wondered if you knew more about was they talk a lot about uh, getting input for this, but obviously the thing you want to do is now send this to the gas pedal or the steering wheel yeah. to turn the car, which they don't really touch on. Do you know how they... I don't. Um, I wouldn't be terribly surprised if it wasn't something like Holden, but I don't actually know what they did. Mm -hmm. but, um, I would be very interested in, in finding out about that at some point. Right. Two, two, two talks that I would love to hear come out of this is like <laughs> a really good talk on Huff transforms, because, uh, or uh, Huff filters, Huff transforms. Uh, because that is an interesting concept that's been around since like what the 50s or 60s that um, <coughs> just ends up in like everything and also more talks about like how they actually drove the darn thing um, but uh, I, I, I suspect that it probably fed into some sort of background mm -hmm. getting neural network and that ultimately led to turn left <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want to trivialize any probably really impressive work that was done in the yeah. Uh, any other questions?